Numbers um, chapter 14, we're going to just pick up where we left off. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to see the last mention of um, the Ark of the Covenant for 40 years. <clears throat> and we've been discussing how following the Ark, which represents the Lord, the Lord's presence and the Lord's pressing toward the promised land to um, uh, find a resting place. <clears throat> and uh, in uh, Numbers 14, let's just look at verse 32. We'll just read a couple of verses here. This is after they didn't go into the land. They came back out and they said, we're not going in. <clears throat> so the Lord speaks. Verse 32, but as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your harlotries until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, every day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities, uh, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it, Unto this evil congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness, they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And then, <clears throat> verse uh, 44, well, you could read verse 40. Uh, and they rose up early in the morning and went up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we are here, and we will go up unto the place, or we will go, yeah, we will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And then, verse 44. But they presumed to go up into the hilltop. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down, the Canaanites who dwelt in that hill, and smote them and routed them even unto Hormah. <clears throat> and so these are the results uh, <clears throat> of, number one, not really following the Ark, or not, and, and let's just put it in New Testament terms, not really following the heart of the Lord into this Thing that was in his heart that David discovered, this desire for a habitation of which Paul makes known to us in the New Testament that we are the church, we are to be his house, and yet not just <clears throat> in some sort of a symbolic way, but rather according to the scriptures that Christ may live his life in us instead of us living a Christian life trying to produce what we cannot produce, trying to do what we cannot do, trying to bring forth what we cannot bring forth, which is pretty much what our worship leader was sharing, <clears throat> and, and uh, failing, and failing, and failing, and failing again. Anybody familiar with that scenario? And so, <clears throat> and so our hearts are to um, follow the ark in the truest sense of the term, and that is uh, because you have to remember now while they're in the wilderness, they are not the habitation of God. They're a flock of sheep. Okay. And, um, but as a flock, you can follow the ark. Amen. As a flock, you can follow him into his place of rest. You can enter into what it is that he has for you. You can, you can uh, become what he intended when he brought you out or shall we put it like this, why he redeemed you, okay? <clears throat> now, all of the, all the miracles in the wilderness and everything, they were wonderful, folks, but they were just to sustain the people as they came to something God wanted. It wasn't all about that. It wasn't all about those things, although God does it. God is a miracle-working God. But, but he, um, uh, through his body, he's not wanting to work miracles on us. He's, if he's going to do anything, he's going to do it through us because we are his body and we are his temple and we are his uh, branches and we are all the things that declares us to be and that is all vehicles of his life. And so it says, and they presume, they presume, they presume, they presume to go up uh, to go into the land to do what God told him to do. But there's one identifying thing and factor here that proves that they did not understand and that proves that this was presumption, and that is the fact that the Ark of the Covenant never departed out of the tent. They are not following his intentions. They are not following his purpose. They're not, they're not going in for him. Now they're ready to go in for themselves so they don't die. 
they don't like the sound of the the tone of what was what was presented so it's it's nothing more you can you can call it spiritual i call it self survival god gave us a, the, a spirit to be able to you know you know a, a strong spirit that we will survive <clears throat> and so um so they 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 don't enter into the land because of their reasons and their purposes and their hearts and of course what what, what is that uh, here's the last the last mention of the ark when it was mentioned constantly up to this point until 40 years later because now Israel is now they're moved by their own fears and their own desires and instead of being moved by God's heart and God's deepest desire they've they've left that they left the ark in the camp and therefore the ark basically in history and in reality left them because let me tell you something the ark had no intention of just wandering around 40 years that was Israel's failure to get behind the ark get behind the Lord into the thing that was most dear to him and uh, let's just face it isn't it true that many Christians today they you know they seek God and they want God but for what purpose? To fulfill their deepest desires, to, to meet their needs, to put themselves first, to, to make them great, to do something with them that, that'll make everybody, you know, sit up and go, oh my God, look, you know, instead of literally being his house where when someone looks, they say, I see Jesus in you. That's not enough. I'm sorry. That's not enough for many Christians. It's not enough that Christ would be seen in us. He has to be seen through us, through some manner that would glorify the vessel. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I want you to consider just for a moment the words, not of us. Not of us. Not of us. Not of us. Now that's the word of God. Not of us. The excellency of the power is him, but it's him through an earthen vessel to prove that it is him and not our goodness, our, our greatness, our, uh, you know, whatever it is. David, who was one of the most honored men by the Lord, started his kingdom rule with one intent. He loved the Lord, and he loved what was in, he saw in God's heart, and he wanted, to, he, he, he wanted to give God the thing that he saw. And remember, and this goes way back to several sharings that I've shared on this, where he saw what no one else saw. Everyone else is seeing the outward and the manifestations, but folks, you're not going to know a person just by what they manifest. You're going to know them better by, by seeing within their heart, by, by discerning what is really real in them. You know, I mean, the, Jesus himself talked about wolves in sheep's clothing. You ever heard of that? But to know the Lord is to see beyond all that he does for us. To look right in there and say, now what is it? You know, because we don't we don't even stop and think. I mean, he does and he does and he does, and we don't even stop and think. He'll just keep doing that because he's a lamb, because he's he has a self-giving nature, and we have a selfish nature. So our selfish nature will say, you know, give me, give me, give me, give me, do for me, do this, you know, and it'll never cease. It will never stop. It will never get satisfied. It will always want more. It wants, it wants, it wants, but he is self-giving. So he'll just give and give and give and give. Until somebody like David comes along and looks into his heart and says, Oh, my Lord, there is something that you have desired. You created us for a reason. You created this earth for a reason. There's something that you actually were after, and I never considered you might have a plan that pertained to you. I always thought it was about me. And what do we call that usually is the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption. But remember the scripture we read in Psalm, what was it, 95 or one of them, where he brought them out, he redeemed them, to bring them unto his holy habitation, to bring him to his habitation. And so they've, they've lost, they've lost the vision. They've lost the heart of God. That's the best way to put it, folks, because we're always talking about vision. Well, what if the vision was simply just seeing the heart of God? 
I mean, I, you know, instead of you know, instead of some super duper spiritual thing, what if the vision was just to see the heart of God, and David found it, and he was just a little shepherd boy who looked deeper and looked past his own needs to see something that the Lord was after. And so, uh, if you will, turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. And here we'll pick up now, having uh, said many of those things prior uh, in our last class. We're now going to read the next appearance of the ark after 40 years. Now remember... In those 40 years, they were never truly following the ark because the ark was trying to get into the land so that the, he could find Zion so that it would be his habitation. Um, Joshua 3, and let's start with verse 13. And it came to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, who bear the ark of the Lord of all the earth, notice the ark of the Lord of all the earth. This is not the ark of Israel. This is the plan of God for all the earth. You say, well, the Jews were carrying it. Yeah, they were, these, they were representing the feet, the body, the, the, the vessel. Um, uh, and when you, sh- you know, <clears throat> what is it? And it come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the, of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand in one heap. And it shall come to pass when the people remove from their tents to pass over the Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they who bore the ark were come into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for the Jordan overfloweth all its banks, all the time of harvest. And let's read a few more verses. And the waters, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose in one heap very far from the city of Adam, very far from the city of Adam, <clears throat> that is beside Zarethan. And those that came down toward the sea of the south, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground till all the people were passed completely over the Jordan. So here we have, uh, once they departed from his path, no more mention of the ark. It takes 40 years before the subject of the ark even comes up or is even mentioned. But now it is mentioned uh, again when Israel was finally ready, when they were finally ready to enter the promised land based on God's heart and desire that he intended when he redeemed them. Can I get amen? Now it's mentioned again, you know, in, in that sense. And, I mean, you know, because you'd say, well, why did, the ark, why did the subject of the Ark of the Covenant come up all suddenly after so long a time? <clears throat> and to really see that, look, uh, and we read it, and I sort of stumbled over it accidentally, but look at verse 14 because I want you to see exactly what it, what it came to pass. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over the Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. Interesting wording that when they removed from their tents, when they came out from their tents, that was their habitation. And they came out from their tents to go after the Ark and his desire for his tent, if you will, Zion, before Solomon's temple. His desire to have a habitation, and and we read it when we began, Psalm 132, for the Lord hath chosen Zion, and then that's David speaking, and then the Lord says, I have desired it for a habitation. Right there in Psalms 132. As, As David opens his heart to the reality of the heart of the Lord that he saw. And so, you know, why did it take so long? 
for that subject to come up again of the ark? <clears throat> it came up because they were finally ready to get back on track with God. It came up because they wanted to move now based on God's purposes. And you can't move based on God's purposes unless you're following the ark because it's the thing that actually started taking you through and pulling, literally pulling them along through the wilderness. Literally, the ark is going before them and it's saying, I'm going. I mean, I sense this, this, this excitement, this, this, this thing in the Lord. That it, and remember, remember, a long time ago I shared on, well, not a long time ago, but you know, three or four times back when I shared that, that uh, God's plan was for this habitation. God's heart was for this habitation. And nobody is getting this thing. And David's starting to see it in the scriptures, which we did share this morning. And so now they are moving out of their tents. And they're moving according to God's heart. And it's bringing them into the Jordan River. What does the Jordan River represent? Death. Most Preachers, scholars, they'll say it represents the cross. It represents not the cross of salvation, the Red Sea is that, but rather the cross that crucifies us. Know ye not, Paul said in, in uh, Romans 6, that your old man is crucified, that now we live by newness of life, but really the actual scripture there says new life, folks. It's new. It's not us. It's not our old life improved. It's him, Christ living in us. And so um, you, you realize from this, this gap of not mentioning the Ark of the Covenant that if we're not moving toward, you know, satisfying the heart of, of the Lord, if we're not moving as a church towards satisfying the heart of the Lord for a habitation, if we're not moving as individuals to satisfy the Lord to become a habit, to empty ourselves so that we might be filled with the life of Christ, if we're, not, if we're, if we're filling ourselves with ourselves, if we're not moving towards that, then we are aimlessly wandering, though we still carry him, because if you're born again, guess what? He's in you. But where? To where? To where? To where? And in the wilderness, it was to nowhere. And so God called that wandering. And God called them wilderness wanderers. Amen? That is the very breakdown. That's the thing that did it all. And, they, and, and in this sense, you can't even say they lost the heart of God, I don't think they ever really saw it. I think they are going after what they believe. You know, they're going, we got God on our side. We got the real God. God's going to do stuff for us. Look, he already did, you know, he, he killed the firstborn. He did this and that. Um, you know, all of these things that are pertaining to us, and aren't we a special people? Aren't we? Yeah, you're real special. He's going to take you to the cross and crucify you so that his son might live in you. That's the word of God. And that's the plan of God for the redeemed. Hallelujah. That's why the Red Sea stood there and they crossed it to redeem. And that's why the Jordan was there long afterwards. Because they needed that Jordan. Because if they didn't cross that Jordan, they would drag their old selfish ways into God's plan. And people wonder why things don't go the way that they need to go. And the reason is, is because... We keep dragging ourselves in it. We keep putting ourselves in the forefront. And so, I do not deny that people have Christ in them. I just, I just believe that they're not carrying him the way that he wanted to be carried. I, I, there's a scripture that goes along that line. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians. Here in 1 Corinthians... Uh, I've alluded to this scripture before in this sharing on habitation. I will uh, get into it major eventually. Um, but this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and look in verse 17. For he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Amen? 
in verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God, and you are not your own? Folks, he is asking believers, don't you know? Know ye not? Don't you know? He's writing to the Corinthian church. He's writing to believers. He's writing to the most spirit-filled, gift-operating group around, the Corinthian church. Can I get amen? I mean, they're the one that's, that, that's got operating in all the stuff. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And then it says, and you are not your own. Folks, you are crucified. Your body is what he bought. Amen. It says right there. And, if it's, and, and that part of you that is alive is joined to the Lord, and he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. But folks, the one spirit is Christ in you. The one spirit is Christ. It is his life. We've been joined to the Lord. And that's what it says, verse 17. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Okay? So this is Christ living in your spirit. This is Christ living in your body. I mean, that's, that's the whole point here. And so Jesus may be with us. He may be with everyone who's truly born again, but not necessarily according to the reason why he joined with you. I, I didn't say he wasn't there. I just said he may not be there according to the reason why he joined with you, and he did join with you. And he joined with you so that he could have a habitation. He joined with you so he could have a body. You know, he didn't, he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. Jesus came and he had his own earthly body. And I'm sure he did just fine in that body. But for some reason, he wanted to inhabit us as his body. And if that's what he wants, I don't think we have any right to hold that from him. And so... Um, Joshua brings them back. Thank God. Thank God. What, what is the, uh, Joshua is the Hebrew name. What is the Greek name for Joshua? Oh, gee, oh, it's Jesus. Oh, Jesus brought them back. Oh, I get it. Jesus brought them back to the purpose, which was to keep your eye on the ark. And in one sense, you could even say that the ark represents the heart of the Lord. Because there's the pillar of cloud, which represents the presence of God, too. Amen? But what if that heart, I mean, what if that ark represented the heart? And I have some things that I'll share eventually someday, probably in the sweet by and by, <laughs> um, on that. Because all these certain articles were placed inside of that and represent things of the heart of God. <clears throat> and so, you know, he brought them back to... Keep your eyes on the ark. Um, follow the ark into his purposes. Because you know what he said to him? The way we're going, you don't know. You have not passed this way before, but we are going into his purposes. Clearly it wasn't their purpose. Clearly he wasn't just bringing them into things that they wanted. It was a way they didn't even know. They didn't even comprehend the way in which they went. So here was Joshua's explanation of how to get it right. Since you don't know, keep your eye on the ark and follow him. Can I get amen? amen. Keep your, you don't know. You know, I'm going to just tell you this. Sometimes the Lord doesn't explain everything to you. He just wants you to follow him. <clears throat> Why? Because... Maybe you're not searching out his heart enough. You're too busy searching him. You know, it's, it's, uh, have you ever seen one of these guys that does these tricks, you know, and they'll walk up, they'll have somebody come up on stage and they'll go, well, how you doing there? And they'll start touching him like this, you know, and everything. And they go, well, how's your, you know, what happened to that watch of yours? And they'll pull up his watch and go, oh man, you know, and then they will go, hey, you know, and he's kind of doing this to him and all this. And then he pulls out his bill. Hey. You know, how'd you get my bill? This is kind of how we do Jesus. We're coming up and we're searching whatever we can find we can get from the Lord. Oh, look what I got, you know? 
instead of sitting at it. And why do you think Mary was such a big deal? Why do you think Mary impressed the Lord? Martha was not was was not a reject the bible says he loved martha and i don't think he was rebuking her for working for him but mary is sitting at his feet and she's hearing his word because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh so she's trying to get to his heart and that's why it touched jesus that's why it meant something to him, because everybody else comes before the throne. I mean, I saw this years and years ago. I, might, like, I was like two months old in the Lord, and I, as it were, came into the throne room, and I sat down, I sat down on the floor at my couch, and I just, as it were, looked up in, into the throne room, and I, I said, Lord, I need this and that and that, and please help so-and-so and do this and that, and work, you know, my job needs this and that, and would you do this and that and everything? You know, and I got through, and I got ready to finish praying because I had said everything that I came in there to say, and all of a sudden I went, oh, my God, what am I doing? What am I doing? I thought, for these past two months, every prayer I've ever prayed has been about what I want. And I bowed my head and I said, Lord Jesus, what's going on with you? How do you see things? What do you, you know, how do you see the kingdom going? You know, and, and, but that's, that's that selfish thing within us that just wants to get what we want from him. And there's no heart. There is no heart for the Lord. We say, oh, yeah, you know, no. There's no true heart that says, Lord, I just want to know what's important to you instead of me picking a subject. You know, saw a report on the, the news, and they're talking about doctors. There's a shortage of family doctors. So they interviewed him. Why is there a shortage of family doctors? Well, there's a shortage because everybody's specializing. And the reason why everyone's specializing is to become a specialist, you make more money. And there's less commitment to the patients. That's, that's it, you know. So let's not, you know, let's not take care of people. Let's not follow our, you know, uh, commitment that we made when we became a doctor. We do the same thing to the Lord, folks. We pick a subject that we special. Oh, I'm a... I'm a uh, I'm an intercessor. Oh, I'm, I'm an evangelist. Well, I'm this and that. Well, that's fine. Good. That's great if the Lord can use you in that way. But what about his heart, period? Isn't there a place where we look for him beyond what our calling is? Isn't there a reality that not all are evangelists, not all are apostles, not all are, you know, intercessors, but doggone it all are priests? And, and I know we even pervert that, but that means that every one of us need to get in there and find what's in the heart of the Lord. We have access. See, we have access means, oh, we can get everything we want when we want it. That's a selfish view of the whole thing. What about his heart? <clears throat> and so uh, entering in the land then in a, in a real way, <clears throat> in a New Testament way, in a way that we can understand is contingent upon one thing. And that's us taking up the ark on our shoulders, shouldering the desire of the Lord and the heart of the Lord and, and, and shouldering him and bringing him forth according to the purpose of his mind. That's what entering the land is. That's, and following those who are doing that and saying, let's get the Lord a habitation. And look at, look at, look at David. <clears throat> You know, we say, oh, the economy's bad and everything's bad and, you know, I don't know how I'm going to make it. When David decided he was going to make a habitation for God, he didn't have any lack for finances. He didn't have any lack for stuff coming in. Anybody remember? Anybody read the story of all this stuff? And everybody started giving and it coming from all countries and stuff like that. He didn't have any trouble once he put the Lord first. See, and I, 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 I said this recently, but, you know, I had somebody tell me. They said, you know, um, you know, I'm really seeking the Lord. I said, well, you know, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And they said, oh, man, I tell you what, I am I'm seeking the kingdom of God. And I said, but are you seeking it first? Are you seeking it first? And so 
<clears throat> entering into the land is when we begin to shoulder the responsibility. And when David shouldered it, God took care of everything he needed. But as long as we're going to be selfish, he has absolutely no desire to foster selfishness in more human beings. There are enough human beings on this planet that are pure selfish. So why should he encourage his people? You know, why won't God take care of this? Why won't God do this? Well, I'll tell you why he won't do it. Because you don't have a heart for God. You have a heart for God to do something for you. And so this shouldering comes into play. Is there a weight? Yes. Is there a burden to it? Yes, there is. And that's written in, in Numbers also. Is there a bearing of it? Yes, there is. But oh, the joy that we'll see when I finish here. How much time we got left on that thing? 30 minutes. Yes, Lord. <laughs> All right. So um, God told him, I will give you vineyards and houses. Didn't he say that? I will give you vineyards and houses. David had a fine house, didn't he? David had a house of cedar. But while he was in it, he went, this isn't right. Or as they say in Texas, this ain't right. This isn't right that I've got this house, but he doesn't have a house. And he's one of the only people who ever sought that. And as it said what it was in Isaiah, did I at any time ever bring this up to anybody? And the answer was no, he didn't. Not because he didn't want it, but because he was hoping somebody would care enough to look and, and to find, to dig around in his heart to find the things that he cared about. <clears throat> so, uh, we have to be dedicated to the staves that I talked about, those poles that, that take the ark. We have to get up. We, you know, we say we're priests, but we only let four guys do it. Folks, there was a rotation, you know, there was a rotation of carrying the ark. There was a lot of priests got under there and shouldered that thing to bring it into his, his habitation and his resting place. And so, you know, when we talk about entering into the promised land, what pops into most people's mind? Let's put it this way. When we talk about promise, entering into the promised land, what pops into our mind? Yeah, milk, what we're going to get. Milk, you know, houses and vineyards and all this kind of stuff. It just shows that we don't have a clue of what was really the pressing of that ark going, come on, come on, let's go, you know. Uh, you know, we, we were just getting comfortable at this spot, and then the ark starts moving forward and everything. And that, Okay, get everything ready. We've got to follow the ark. But they were just following. They didn't know where he was going, and we need to know where he's going, and we need to have that, that same heart. Look in, since we're in the New Testament, look over in Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 2, we begin to see this because this is one of the first mentions of Jesus um, in this earth. Luke 2 and uh, verse, uh, <clears throat> well, 7. This is talking about Mary at the birth of Jesus. And she brought forth, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Folks, many churches have not made room for Jesus. They, their focus has not been upon establishing a place for Jesus in terms of becoming his house, in terms of being his resting place. They become just like Bethlehem, and they, they become like the innkeeper. They, they don't give him that place. And as soon as Jesus came into this world, we pushed him out. We pushed him out. Now, you know, but I mean, let's consider this. But even if there are churches, even if there are churches that give him place during their church services and, and uh, uh, they open their inn unto him. You understand what I'm saying? They open their church services to him. They invite him in. And it's, but it is like an inn. And an inn is not a permanent resting place. Oh, we let him, you know, we let him show up for our services. Do you let him show up on Monday in your life? As your life? Well, no, I don't even think about that. 
I do what I do. I got my plans. I will ask God to bless that. I ask God to, to look after me instead of I am a priest. And folks, the priest's job was to look after God. Look after God and look after his high priest. <laughs> the priests, the Levites, were a gift to the high priest. Did you know that? They were a gift. Who's our high priest? <laughs> we are supposed to be his gift instead. He's our gift. Okay, take care of this. Take care of that. You know, <clears throat> do all these different things for me. And so, um, you know, David, <clears throat> he carried the ark to Zion. But for us, it's even higher than that because we're supposed to be the Zion of his heart. We're supposed to be the place of his habitation. And I know, I know, I know. Everybody that talks about Zion, all they talk about is David set up singers and everybody sat in a big tent and sang to the ark. Folks, the ark, I mean, the ark and, and David's tabernacle represent more than singers. It represents the habitation of God. And the proof of that is the scriptures. You know what? The, the proof of that, I mean, if Psalm 132 says it's plain out. I have desired Zion for a habitation. That was before singers showed up. And that is just an Old Testament shadow of a greater truth that, folks, there's a lot of great Praise and worship going on, and you know that I love good praise and worship, and I lead praise and worship, and I am blessed with the different people we have around here that does it. But, folks, there's something higher than just gathering to sing to him. We are supposed to let him live in us. We are Zion. <clears throat> and so let's, let's see this. Let's, it's just so... Uh, overwhelming as the next scriptures we're going to go to because what we're going to see is finally somebody's going to give the Lord what he wanted we're going to see his response we're going to literally see a God response okay and usually I mean look at when he walked he healed this person he cast out demons in that person he did this and that but every once in a while every once in a while he would go, oh, have you ever seen such great faith? As, have you ever, you know, just, it was like two times, I think, where he was impressed, where he liked it. Well, that's what we want to see here. So let's go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. You know, we'll read First Kings. I think Second Chronicles is also a good example of this. First uh, Kings eight, verse um, six. <clears throat> and the priest brought. Are you there yet? First Kings eight, verse six. Uh, and the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord into its place. Listen to what that says. It had never been there before. But that's the place. It's his place. It's the place he'd been after all of those years. Listen to that. Into his place. Into the inner sanctuary of the house. Folks, the inner sanctuary is right into your heart where he lives. What is the heart? It's not this physical pump. It's your motives. Are your motives pure? Well, no, they're not. <laughs> No, they're not. But if Christ lives in there, they are because they're his desires. They're his motives. It's his mind. Let this mind be in you. Uh, you are crucified along with your affections and lusts. And the word lust there, I know you think it means some sort of perverted sexual desire. But folks, the word lust there is simply your own desires, the things that you pursue, your ambitions. And it says in Galatians Five, right after it talked about the fruit of the Spirit, which is not yours but his, it says your affections, which include love, 
your, your kind of love, your kind of joy, your kind of peace. Folks, that's right after that scripture. You say the answer is to let the Holy Spirit move in you. No, the answer is for you to be crucified so that the life of Christ and the Holy Spirit can live through you. Hello. And so they brought it into his place, into the inner sanctuary of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the ark and the Cherubim covered the ark and its staves above, and they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they were not seen outside, and they are, and there they are unto this day. They drew out, and this was part of the responsibility of the Koath and Marianites and, and all the guys that was responsible for the articles. Um, once they set it up, they would always draw. I've read many commentaries on this, and almost no one tells you that they did draw them out any time it rested, but they did. But this time was different. They drew out the staves for good. Hallelujah. No more carrying him to his habitation. This is it. This is the temple that he always wanted, if you will. Now, we'll explain that in just a second. And so um, it, it was the end of the staves. I, how, how much, I got plenty of time. Let's go to Second Chronicles 5 because I'd just like to read a little more of this. I'd like for you to really, really get the feel of exactly what happened on that day. This is Second Chronicles 5, and we'll start in verse uh, 2. <clears throat> we'll, just, we'll just read, uh, man, we'll read the rest of the chapter and a few verses into the next. Is that Okay. Because it's so precious. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the princes of the fathers, the children of, Is of the children of Israel unto Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Folks, at this point, they're bringing it out of David's tabernacle into Solomon's temple. Okay? Wherefore, all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast, which was in the seventh month, and all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. Take it up and bring it. Amen? You ever heard that phrase, bring it? We say that in Oak Cliff a lot. Bring it. God's saying, bring it. Bring the ark. And they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation, all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, these did the priests and the Levites bring up, also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled unto him before the ark, sacrificed sheep and oxen, oxen which could not be counted nor numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto its place, to the inner sanctuary of the house, into the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim covered the ark and the, its staves above, and they drew out the staves of the ark, that the ends of the staves were, not, were, were seen from the ark before the inner sanctuary, but they were not seen without. And there it is unto this day. <laughs> unto this day the staves are out. There was nothing in the ark except the two tables which Moses put in it at Horeb when the when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, and it came to pass when the and it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present were sanctified, and did then wait by course. Also the Levites, who were the singers of all them of Asaph, of Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their children, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psaltery and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets. And it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanksgiving the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals, instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that... Then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. And then just a few verses in, um, Then said Solomon, The Lord hath said he would dwell in the thick darkness, but I have built a house 
of habitation for thee, a place and a place for thy dwelling forever. Folks, this is, uh, the temple is built. It's permanent. It's not an inn. It's not a church service. It's, it's, it's permanent. And the ark is brought in and it's put into the, its place. Its place where it is, this is your home. And folks, they're not calling this the temple. They're calling this, you can read it at the end of 13, uh, that then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord. And then the, verse 14, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Are, are, you, are you catching this? Once, it was set, once the ark was set in his resting place and the staves were taken out, this is it. This is permanent. Then, uh, you know, and the staves that were used for carrying, they were drawn out for the last time, signifying your journey and days are over. You're home. You are home. And Solomon says, but I built a house of habitation for thee, a place of dwelling for you forever. There is no thought of a religious edifice there. There is no thought of, of uh, 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 making it our house. The house we call, you know, a church building we call the house of God, but it's our house. It's where we come. It's where we do what we do. It's where, you know, but we're the house and we're supposed to be inhabited by Christ, but we haven't accepted the cross. And then we haven't accepted the resurrection. And so um, there's, there's a really, really good scripture. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to ending here, but there's a really good scripture in Isaiah chapter 11. Turn there with me because I think you'll enjoy this one. Because there is this reality. <clears throat> Isaiah 11. And this is... Um, this is after Solomon's temple is built, but what happens after that? Solomon's temple, folks, was eventually destroyed. It was eventually destroyed because God had yet a higher permanent house. Verse 10 of Isaiah 11, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Who's Jesse? David's dad. <laughs> this man, praise God. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand for an ensign of the people. Do you know what an ensign is? It is a, you, it's, a, it's the banner of what we stand for. It's striking it into the ground and saying, this is the ground. This is God's ground. This is what we represent. This is what we're about. We drive that stake in the ground and we say, here is God's ground. It shall be an ensign for the peoples. To him shall the nations seek and his rest shall be glorious. His rest. Folks, we're supposed to enter into his rest, which is becoming the house. Remember, we shared that this morning. Hebrews 3, 6 says it and then moves into why do you harden your heart? Why won't you enter in? Why won't you enter into his rest? Why won't you become living stones? Why do you have to be more than just a habitation? And you understand. I mean, I understand that there are gifts and ministries and all this kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. We've got plenty of that, and yet we don't have a habitation for the Lord through the Spirit yet. So we're all getting to exercise stuff, but he's not getting to rest. And we're not entering into rest, and we're wondering why this thing isn't working. Look at the church. My God, you know. You know, well, we need more anointing. No, we need more of the anointed. His name's Christ, and he wants to live in us. We need more Jesus. He, John said it best, he must increase and I must decrease. That's the plan. That's what it's about. So Solomon's temple was destroyed, and God wants to make us the house. 
God wants to make us his body. Solomon's temple still was a shadow of the true. And uh, I, I've got Hebrews written down here so I could just quote it. But Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast? If we enter into being his rest, his house, his habitation, and we hold that confidence, and this is an ensign and a sign to the people, and it's a stake driven into the ground, this is what in his heart, and we stand for it in the earth. And we hold that firm unto the end. Well, what is the end of that? What, what is the end of Hebrews 3 into 4? that we, we actually decrease and that he actually fills the house and he actually spreads out and that's what that cloud was. It's like he came in and he began to make himself at home and he spread out in his home because that's what they called it, his house. He came into his house and he spread out and when he spread out, that was the end of all of us and our doing. Every minister and priest down on his face. Down because why? Not just because he's going to minister, although he will, folks, because if we are his house, if we are his body, if we are his body, who's doing the ministry? The life in the body. And that, what, what do we call his name again? Jesus, yeah. He's doing the ministry. So that all of these things proceed from him and he gets all the glory. It's not like we push the cloud up and over. And, and uh, I was working with my dog the other day. And he would come to the front of, of the kennel part and, and to, to train him and what I needed to train him. I had to push him back to the back of the thing. Well, that's just like us. You know, the cloud comes in. We lay down. Oh, we can't, we can't go for this. No, man. We start pushing the cloud, taking part of the room that belongs to him to establish us. Instead of just being that whole house through whom he will manifest. And folks, that right there was the biggest, the highest, the clearest, and the most powerful picture because that was the pinnacle of the shadow. The shadow. And the end result is we're flattened. Again, you see a picture of that in the New Testament where Jesus goes into the temple and starts just driving stuff out. It's my father's house. Get out of here. Get, take this. Get, take this hints is what he said. You know, and how do you translate that? In Spanish, it would be saca la vaca. In Texan, it'd be get that out of here. Get it out. Well, what is the crap, the cow, the whatever? It is us trying to take up his room, his house, and not having any respect for his house, not having any respect for his home and where he lives and this sort of thing. So, you know, it's the result of this whole thing of, of him wanting a house the shadow is just showing you. It's like he had been waiting and waiting and waiting for the staves to be drawn out. Permanent. He had been waiting for a people. And who was that people? Well, it was Israel, but it was King David who passed it on to his son. And I'll just say this. I mean, I believe, I believe David represents a picture of Christ and I believe that Solomon represents a picture of the Holy Spirit. And I'll get into this uh, um, somewhere, you know, as I finish sharing this. Because I want to I show the work of the Holy Spirit in relationship to this whole thing. And so, um, you know, he enters his rest. He enters his rest. And when he gets there, he does, he's not shy about it. He knocks everything that's 
doesn't belong in his house down and says, I've been waiting a long, long time. I've been giving you a bunch of stuff. And now he just spreads out and he makes himself comfortable. And now it's not, it's the end of man and ministries. And I'll just, you know, I'll just end it, you know, with that thought that it is his home, his new house. And And the New Testament scripture that I guess more clearly says it to me, that is the fulfillment of what we just read in 1 Kings and in Corinthians, is Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, not I. Christ lives in me, it is him taking possession of his house. It is him doing it in the manner of Galatians 2.20 that was always, always, always on his heart. And the bridge between that, folks, the bridge between the old covenant shadow and the new covenant fulfillment was a man named David, was a man named David who did what no other man did. He pursued God for his heart and not for his David's own. And he stayed with it all his life. And he wanted that habitation maybe as much as God. He wanted to see God gain that habitation. He he. When, you know, we talked about it. When he was out in the woods, we, uh, Psalm 132, when he was out in the woods and being chased by Saul and living out under the thing and thinking, when I was home, when I was a kid, I could drink the water of Bethlehem. I could, I could rest. I didn't have to be on alert all the time. And that's where it began to come to him. And when he, was, uh, uh, um, when he did live in Bethlehem and felt the comfort of family and loved ones in a home, and now he doesn't feel it, and all of a sudden it starts coming to him my lord god doesn't have rest and he made it and he says i you know let's 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 close just with reading that one more time psalm 132 132 <clears throat> psalm 132 in verse 1, Lord, remember David and all his affliction, all that he went through, all the enemies he had because he wanted God to have a house. He wanted the people, if you will, he wanted the people to be his house, and they just wanted to be Christians. Remember all the affliction, Lord. How he swore unto the Lord, he swore unto the Lord, and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. And this came to him when he was still young and he prayed about it. He couldn't sleep at night. And when he woke, I'm sure he, it was on his mind and on his heart. He said, God, that your people would be a habitation. God, that I could carry the ark in such a manner. In such a manner that people would hear more than a good sermon, that they would, their hearts would be touched and they would begin to turn their direction from themselves and pursuing God for their own ends. And that all the ends of the earth, however far it could be taken, however far the ensign could be established, even if just one or two or three, that they would become this habitation of God. 
And then he says where he got it from. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrathah, which is Bethlehem. We found it in the fields of the wood when he was being chased. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship as his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. His resurrection, his re- arise, O Lord, his resurrection was supposedly out of his, incar- his, his body that he was incarnated in into the body which is the body of Christ, the church. Arise, O Lord, into your rest. And the very heart of Paul began to comprehend, God, what kind of men are these? What kind of men are these? Paul began to see it too. But he saw the living reality, living in a time called the New Covenant. And he spent his life and he, he, he was beaten, and he was rejected, and he was stoned, and he was hated. But he just kept going, and he said, We are meant to be the habitation of God. It is Christ in you. You are crucified. He even, he even spoke the cross different than the regular people. Not just Jesus died for us, he died so you would be dead so that he could live in you. And then, since we're getting close here at the end, verse 13, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. And I'm going to say this. You can read this in Acts 15, that when they were arguing whether the Gentiles should be, they had this big meeting and everybody came up, all the church, in the book of Acts, this big meeting where the Gentiles should be under the law. Paul spoke something. Peter spoke something. But listen to me. There was a man named James that ended it all. He ended the whole conversation. He ended it all. And you know what? James was the leader of the church. And he ended the whole thing. And he quoted out of Amos how, in the last days I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And that tabernacle of David is in the that's the true Zion of his heart because there it was more pure and there it, it didn't fall back into a religious edifice that was filled with all sorts of vile things where am I getting that from Ezekiel who saw all this stuff in the in the temple and said you know eventually just kept seeing the wrong stuff in there us our junk until the glory departed. And folks, we all talk about the glory departing. The glory is nothing more than the Lord being the one who is the inhabitor. The inhabitor left his habitation because everything else was in there. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. Now that was David speaking, verse 14, the Lord jumps in. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame. But upon himself shall his crown flourish. And that is David. They said of Jesus, oh, son of David, the one who's building the house. And there is this reality because they all fulfill this this portion where they inhabit the house. It is a habitation for the spirit, although that does not say what you think it does. And we'll get into that. But the Holy Spirit does inhabit us. And Christ inhabits us. And the Father inhabits us. And he said, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days. I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. And Paul took that same scripture and he set and he showed it to be mean. We would be a habitation of God, the temple of God. 
Let's stand together. In my next sharing along this line, I would, I want to share with you, whenever that is, I want to share with you how Solomon got this. It is an incredible, I don't just mean sort of good, incredible reality because David saw the heart of God. But Solomon was chosen to build it. And yet in the beginning, Solomon didn't know how to do it, didn't, know, didn't have the desires of David. And we see that it, ultimately he still didn't have the full desires of David. But he got this one, and he got it in a special way. We want to see that. We want to see what, how this thing it keeps rolling forward until we have become the fulfillment of that, if indeed we are. Father, I just so pray that there would be priests, there would be those who would rather be a priest than a, an apostle. Lord, you know what I mean when I pray that. Others may misunderstand that. But there would be priests that would take you up and bring you to others and that it would be as if they brought you into your habitation and those others would hear the message, the reality, and you would come in in a whole new way. You'd come in in a way that would fill them, that would fill them as a house. Lord, I just pray. I pray that you could be glorified if it be ever so small that with whatever we have and what time that we have and what, whatever, if, if you give us two people to listen, Lord, that would be enough. We don't need thousands. We don't need to reach the whole world. We just want to be faithful priests carrying you to those that would allow you to be a habitation. Lord, we'd be faithful in that which is least. And so, Father, grant the Holy Spirit to begin the process by clearly opening our eyes. Lord, in my case, not opening my eyes to your heart. I was too hard. I was too self-occupied. But somehow you opened my eyes to David's heart. And when you did, Lord, you touched my heart. You let me know that there are men Men like David and Paul who truly, truly with all their being wanted to glorify you in the way that you would have desired. Lord, grant the opening of the heart and the eyes of those here and those who hear this. We may join with your purposes. We may priest forth your purposes. And that you would be so overjoyed as the staves are drawn out and that would be it. This is it. This is, this is your rest. This is your Zion. So, Father, I have not the words. I don't know how to pray as I ought. You know I pray in the Spirit a lot because I don't know. I ask you, Lord, to bring forth the things that you desire in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.